continue. The teaching of Sri Bhagavan was intensely practical. He expounded theory only in answer to the specific needs and questions of devotees and as a necessary basis for practice. When reminded once that Buddha had refused to answer questions about God, he replied with approval. In fact, Buddha was more concerned with directing the seeker to realize bliss here and now than with academic discussions about God and so forth. So also, he himself would often refuse to gratify curiosity, turning the questioner instead to the need for sadda, sadhana, or effort. Ask about the posthumous state of man, he might reply, why do you want to know what you will be when you die before you know what you are now? First find out what you are now. A man is now and eternally the deathless self behind this and every other life. Be told so, or to believe it is not enough. It is necessary to strive to realize it. Similarly, if asked about God, he might reply, why do you want to know about God before you know about yourself? First find out what you are. The process by which this is done is described in a later chapter, but since the next chapter already recounts Sri Bhagavan's instructions to devotees, reference is made to it and his teachings here. That his, teachings, that his teaching was not philosophy in the usual sense of the term may be seen from the fact that, as will appear in his replies to Shiva Prakasham Pillai in the next chapter, he did not instruct his devotees to think out problems but to eliminate thought. This may sound as though the process is stupefying, but as he explained to Paul Brunton in the conversation quoted in chapter two, the reverse is true. A man is identical with the self, which is pure being, pure consciousness, pure bliss. But the mind creates the illusion of a separate individuality. In deep sleep, the mind is stilled, and a man is one with the self, but in an unconscious way. In samadhi, he is one with the self in a fully conscious way, not in darkness, but in light. If the inference of the mind is stilled, the consciousness of self can, by the grace of the guru, awaken in the heart, thus preparing for the blissful identity, for a state that is not torpor or ignorance, but radiant, knowledge, pure, I amness. Many may recoil from the idea of destruction of the mind, or, what comes to the same thing, of the separate mind, of the separate individuality, and find it terrifying, and yet it happens to us daily in sleep, and far from being afraid to go to sleep, we may find it desirable and pleasant, even though in sleep the mind is stilled only in an ignorant way. In rapture or ecstasy, on the other hand, the mind is momentarily absorbed and stilled in a fragmentary experience of bliss that is its true nature. The very words indicate the transcending of the individuality, since rapture means etymologically being carried away in ecstasy standing outside oneself. The expression, it is breathtaking, really means it is thought-taking, for the source of thought and breath is the same as Sri Bhagavan explained when speaking of breath control. The truth is that the individuality is not lost, but expanded to infinity. The elimination of thoughts is for the purpose of concentrating on the deeper awareness that is behind and beyond thought. Far from weakening the mind, it strengthens it, for it teaches concentration. Sri Bhagavan frequently confirmed this. It is the weak and uncontrolled mind that is currently distracted by irrelevant thoughts and harassed by unhelpful worries. The mind that is strong enough to concentrate, no matter on what, can turn its concentration to the elimination of thoughts in quest of the self, and conversely the effort to eliminate thoughts in the manner prescribed gives strength and power of concentration. When the quest is achieved, the faculties of the mind are not lost. Sri Bhagavan illustrated this by comparing the mind to the jnani, to the moon in the sky at midday, is illuminated, but its light is not needed in the greater radiance of the sun which illuminates it. That's the end of chapter 9 from The Mind of Uttamana Maharshi by Arthur Osborne.